Hey everyone, what is up and welcome back to another episode of the Lifestyle Lifter Show. I'm your host, your online transformation coach, Adrian McDonald, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Jeff Hain. Jeff is a certified strength conditioning coach. He's a master's in human performance and nutrition, and he is the host of the Mind Muscle Connection podcast. Jeff, welcome to the Lifestyle Lifter Show, my man. Awesome, Adrian. Yeah, thanks, man, for having me on. I know we've known each other for years now, and um, it's cool to be able to connect on here and, and chat on the podcast. And like I said, I'm honored uh, to be on the show. Awesome, man. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. So before we get going about body recomposition, building muscle, toning up, looking your best for summertime, share a bit about yourself, Jeff, that just share about your backstory so that people can learn a bit more about you and what got you into fitness in the first place. Yeah, man. So I've been coaching for probably seven to eight years now. It was like a little bit in person to start. Now I've fully switched to online. So I work just in an online capacity now with clients. That's the way to go, right? You're able to reach a lot more people that way and connect on podcasts and things like that. As far as my background in fitness, I started picking up weights when I was like 12, had my dad dad's dumbbells, um, doing push-ups, was all upper body focused for a while. And then I played sports in high school and got into a little bit more lifting there wasn't really a huge fan of it for like sports. I wanted to just focus on hanging out with my boys and going after girls on the weekends and stuff like <laughs> that. That was w- what I look forward to. But then when I got out of uh, high school, man, I really get, fell in love with it. It became a part of my day and really haven't looked back since. I've done a couple like natural bodybuilding shows in the process and then pretty much have just gone full force into learning everything I can about nutrition, like you said, fat loss, muscle growth. And that's pretty much how my days are structured now at, at this point. So I just love it. My my goal really is to just continue to build as much muscle as I can and just find ways to help apply those to, to clients as well too. And not getting any younger at this point, learning how to also stay injury free in the process. And, and, and again, I know this was something you said you potentially wanted to talk about, but keeping these results long-term as well too is super important. So, just a little background on me there. Hopefully that was helpful. I don't know if there's anything else you want to uh, follow up there with that. Yeah, yeah, no, awesome, awesome. That's all really su- super helpful. Just so listeners learn a bit more about you, Jeff. And uh, Jeff, you're also, you're from St. Louis, Missouri. Is that right? Yep, smack in the middle of the USA, man. That's about <laughs> three hours from flight both ways to get to the e- either coast. But yep, in the middle, in the Midwest. I always tell people, if you don't have family here or you don't have a work trip here, you're probably not going to ever come to to St. Louis, Missouri. But <laughs> yeah, we have the arch. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that overseas or anything like that or outside of the state, but we have the, the arch. It's like a kind of this arch thing that's supposed to be like the gateway to the West, basically. Amazing, so that's man. what we're known for. So <laughs> yeah, deadly, deadly. And, and Jeff, something you're known for on a personal standpoint, professional standpoint also is mastering body recomposition, which is the process of building muscle and losing fat simultaneously. Jeff, as of this episode being uploaded, we are roughly 12 weeks away from the start of summertime. I know a lot of people now, they want to be going on holidays. They want to feel confident with their top off. They don't want to be the ones with the sun coming down and then covering themselves up or feeling uncomfortable. We all want to look leaner. We all want to look fitter during the summertime. So for anyone looking to get in shape for summer and then being able to maintain those results long-term, Jeff, let's just maybe start out with nutrition. What are some practical implementation strategies that we could use to get there yeah so if we're going to talk specifically like from a body recomp standpoint like you said there body recomp like you said that kind of losing body fat and building muscle and i'd like to break this down into two distinct things where we have a short-term body recomp where it's you lose body fat and build muscle at the same time right that's the perfect that's what everyone wants right they want to be a little bit leaner they want to build a little bit more muscle and so that's the the, what i call short-term body recomp right this is where again you can do those at the same time and and There's specific conditions within that are going to be super helpful for you to be able to get there to be able to do these at the same time. I think one kind of thing around that a lot of people think is it's not possible, right? That's too good to be true. But as we look into it a little bit more, it's actually a lot more possible in in, in a larger uh, population than than people think. So I'll briefly go over that and then I'll tie in the nutrition aspect to all this. So people that are are able to do that a little bit more are going to be people who, you know, maybe haven't lifted weights for very long, right? They're going to be in a great spot to do that. If you have higher body fat levels, right? So maybe you're somebody who's like trying to decide between, hey, should I build muscle first or lose body fat first? If you're somebody who has higher body fat levels, you're able to do both at the same time there with that. Maybe you're somebody who's coming off like an injury or a long layoff from the gym, but you used to train a lot. Like you're in a good spot here to be able to lose body fat and build muscle. And then the one that 
I surprises people is maybe you are somebody who's been training for a while, right? And you're like, I've just been doing it for a while. I, I can't body recomp. I've been training for five plus years. But what I find and, and what I find when a lot of clients come to me is they're missing at least one to two of the pieces of we have the training side of things. Maybe they've been training, but it hasn't necessarily been geared towards building muscle as optimally as, as they could be. So it's maybe they're lifting weights, but they're not like over, they're not progressively overloading. Uh, maybe they're doing too much training volume or they could improve their execution. Sure. From a nutrition standpoint, which kind of goes into your question here, maybe they're off from a protein standpoint. Maybe they're not eating enough protein. Maybe they're yeah. eating a little bit too much, or maybe they're not eating enough. They're not fueling their body enough. They're not putting it in a good spot to want to build muscle. And then we have things outside of the gym, right? So things like sleep, stress management, those are uh, big things that people often overlook as well. Maybe their sleep's off or maybe their stress is super high compared to the amount of training that they're doing. So I usually find that somebody's doing well at least in, in maybe one or two of those, but then they're not, they've never tied all of them together at the same time. Maybe you've been training for a while, but training can improve, nutrition can improve a little bit. And it's like you have some runway here to be able to lose body fat and build muscle at the same time. And again, a lot of people are, when they come to me, they're, they're that's that those are the people that can improve or they have the biggest room to, to body recomp there is, is they can just improve something out of those things that I just talked about. And then lastly, we have a long-term body recomp, which at some point people are going to have to go to, and that's where you lose muscle or you build muscle and lose body fat over longer periods of time, right? At, at that point, we're probably going to have to go into more dedicated phases of fat loss, more dedicated phases of of building muscle there with that. That was my summary of body recomp first. Did you have any follow-ups to that? Or do you want me to go back to the question around nutrition? No, absolutely. Like literally everything you said there, I'm with you and all of that 100% that typically body recomp newbie gains someone who might be detrained or they lay off with injury as you said maybe like someone with that skinny fat physique often is a common yep. one and probably one other element too but jeff you and i don't need to worry about this is let's be real if you're taking testosterone and you're, or you're taking steroids yeah you're probably in a better position to be able to lose fat and build muscle simultaneously but we're just speaking to the vast majority of people who are just natural here jeff so yep. when it comes to when it comes to so like doing a body recomp, getting in shape, looking your best, what would you say, first of all, from your own professional standpoint or some common misconceptions people have when it comes to their nutrition? Yeah. So common uh, misconceptions around nutrition. So I think one, it's they think that they need to just eat as little as possible if they're trying to like fat, like if they're trying to lose body fat, right? It's, hey, I just need to just eat chicken, broccoli and rice. And that will certainly help. But I think, again, there's not enough like kind of flexibility there with that. And I think a lot of times people often under fuel themselves uh, when they come from that mindset. And then again, our two goals of a body recomp are to lose body fat and build muscle. And you may lose some body fat in that process, but you might you're probably not putting yourself in the best position to build muscle in that process. So I think under fueling and just being in this like super restrictive mindset around nutrition, like I know I used to do that when 10, 10 plus years ago when I wanted to lose body fat, it was just like, oh, I just need to eat super clean and just find the lowest calorie items. And then you end up like not being fueled enough to build muscle and may have some micronutrient deficiencies. You may be missing out on essential vitamins and minerals. You may be completely neglecting uh, a macro, whether that be carbohydrates or protein, right? Something might be super low there with cool. that. And you're just not putting your body in the most optimal position, right? That that it feels good um, there with that. So I think a big kind of misconception is thinking that if you want to get lean, you just need to eat very little amounts. And as you've done a bodybuilding show, there might be a period of time when you need to eat a really small amount to get super shredded and to get super lean. But we just don't want that to be something that we do all the time, 24 seven, right? There's periods of time where maybe you do push it a little bit more. Um, but we also want to make sure that we are fueling ourselves enough um, there with that. And so that's what one big misconception. I don't know if you have any uh, follow ups to that or, or anything. Yeah, no, man, I'm with you. And um... I really like the approach that you mentioned there that with a lot of people, it's actually addition rather than subtraction that if you just add, focus on adding a bit more protein, add a bit more fiber, often people think that they're eating a lot of food, but they're just eating a lot of volume. And volume eating, I know, is a very effective strategy, whether you are particularly doing a body recomp because the goal should be to eat as much food as possible while staying within your calories. And a good way is to have a high protein, lean protein sources at every meal, lots of micronutrients, lots of fiber, as you mentioned there as well, Jeff. When it comes to then calculating your calories for that body recomp, where, what's a practical standpoint for most people? I know there's one, there's no one size fits all, but just some general guidelines here. 
Yeah. So let me pull up my exact number here for maintenance. So what I like to do is for this, we're going for a body recomp. I do think it, it, it really does depend on where the person is at specifically, but say you are somebody who you want to maximize both, right? And, and say you are in that maybe but you have a little bit of body fat to lose. You still need to build some muscle. I think the best place to be in for a body recomp to start would be a small calorie deficit. Okay. Yeah. And rather than looking at like your exact calorie number, like the, the deficit you need to be in. What I like to do and, and how I like to go through this process is let's find a good baseline of around your maintenance calories, right? So totally. you can either do this by taking your body weight and multiplying it by 12 to 15. So whatever your yeah. body weight is, multiply that by 12 to 15. That's a good just baseline. Okay. You can also use you can also use macro calculators online too to just again get a baseline. Now within that though, there is going to have to be some trial and error with that. Okay, just because these calculators will get you within the ballpark, but it's not going to be super. Ac- it may not be accurate for you, right? How much somebody, how much energy somebody expends throughout the day is very genetic and and individual there with that. So what I like to do is get a baseline, and then we take two, three, four weeks to see where their weight's trending, and that that gives us a good idea of where they're at, right? If your weight stays relatively stable on average over two, three, four weeks, you're likely at your maintenance, right? You know where that's at. If it's trending up, you're in a somewhat of a surplus, right? So you'll need to find ways to either increase your activity or reduce your the amount of food you eat. If it's trending down, you're in a deficit. So again, we use this. I don't know if I gave you number, but I think 12 to 15 is a good yeah. kind of number there on that. So we get that baseline and then we make adjustments. From there, what I like to do is monitor their body weight and their caloric intake. And we want to try to aim for a 0.25 to 0.5% of body weight loss per week. So if you're, sorry, I'm going to use, I'm going to use American uh, numbers here. Yeah, so 170 let, let, pounds, let's go ahead, man. <laughs> uh, if you're 170 pounds, we're looking at about 0.4 to 0.8 pounds of weight loss per week, right? So I like to go off of trends to see where their body weight's going, because Again, that's going to make it very indiv- individual. If you're not hitting those numbers there, we'll make an adjustment from either a caloric standpoint or an adherence standpoint or a movement standpoint, right? So sure. I like to get people in a small calorie deficit for a body recomp initially, right? And the biggest reason for that is if we want to lose body fat, we do want to send some sort of, we want to be in a calorie deficit. So you do want to see your weight trend down. However, from a muscle building standpoint, if our deficit is too big, we're, we're losing weight too quickly, that's not going to be you're not going to put your body in great position to build muscle at that point. So we can be in a small calorie deficit to elicit the fat loss, but also that small calorie deficit will be enough to put you in a solid spot to um, build muscle um, as well too uh, there with that. So that's how I would do it. Typically, if you do have a lot of muscle already, but you still want to see a recomp, maybe we'll put you closer to maintenance and we want to see your body weight um, maintained there um, with that. Hopefully that was uh, helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Like such a great point for anyone doing that body recomp. The most important thing is Jeff alluded there is that when you're dropping the fat, you want to maximize your fat loss and minimize your muscle gain because otherwise you just become a smaller, skinnier fat version of yourself. And nobody wants that look either, Jeff. I'm curious, what's your preferred macro split for someone doing a body recomp? Would it be like a 40, 40, 20 protein, carbohydrate, fat or again, I know it, it would vary individual to individual, but just even your own personal preference, Jeff. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So I think how I typically do this is we'll look at, so I don't really go off of splits, right? Typically looking at is, okay, what's their calorie amount? And then from there, we're going to go off of minimum. I like to hit minimums for for yeah. certain macros. Okay. So for protein, we're going to go around one gram per pound of body weight. So again, I think that's two, I think that would be 2.2 kilo for kilo per I think is what that would translate yeah. to. Sorry, I'm, I'm not great at those yeah, conversions. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, no, it, and that's what I always say, like two to 2.2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. So one pound or two to 2.2 grams, all go there, Jeff. Keep going, man. You're doing awesome. Yeah, so that that's the minimum for protein. And then from there, we're going to make sure we're at a minimum of about 20% of your body weight for fat. So again, if you're 170 pounds, 20% of that would be, I think 30, like around 34 grams. And then, so that's the minimum from there. And then I like to, in a body recomp, get a minimum of one gram per pound of body weight for carbohydrates is a minimum, yeah. right? And those are our minimums that we're hitting. And from there, we'll, whatever we have left over from the calories left over, we'll, we'll throw those towards whatever macros the client can stick to and enjoys, right? Ideally, it would be at this point, probably carbohydrates. That way they have enough energy to really push their training. Um, But it does depend if they like to eat a little bit higher fat, maybe we'll add in a little bit more fat. If they by chance like going higher protein, you know, that's an option as well too. We just want to make sure that like, 
protein doesn't get so high that now it's taking away from carbohydrates or fats, right? Because sure. if your carbs are too low, that's probably not going to be great from a, a training perspective. Carbohydrates can help with recovery. They give you energy for training. So that's how I typically do it, right? It's a combination of let's hit minimums, but then from there, let's see what the client likes and and then whatever's left over, we go from there. So I try to be somewhat flexible with that just because again, I have found that to be most helpful from a long-term uh, sustainability consistency aspect. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. And, and speaking of sustainability, nutrition is often from my own coach perspective where most people have the biggest amount of challenges, Jeff. It's not necessarily the hour in the gym, it's the 23 hours outside of that. And you alluded to it already from an adherence standpoint, that's going to be most important. So what are some practical ways to help increase someone's adherence to their nutrition so that they're able to hit their daily metrics, their daily calories, protein, carbs, et cetera, on a consistent basis? Yeah, there's a lot of different things you can do. I'll start with first, I think having some sort of plan each day. I think if you go into it, just winging it, you know, doing it, if it fits your macros approach and you're just going to, I like to call this a reactive tracker where they just eat and then they, they track food. Right. I think that's the first thing you can do is have some sort of game plan for the day. Okay. Is, and whether you plan that out for the, the week or just the night before you plan it out, whatever it is, having some sort of game plan for the day, I think it's the first thing you can do to, to actually Absolutely. stick to your macro goal, right. Or, or calorie goal there with that. Another thing I like to do is and this can go back to planning, but I like to set up a structure with clients where they eat about the same amount of meals per day. I understand that maybe you can't do that every single day, but if we can set a good baseline of, hey, you're going to eat three meals per day or four meals per day, whatever it is, I think that can be super helpful because again, it takes a lot of the guesswork out with it. And as you know, there's going to be some hunger involved when you're dropping body fat. And a lot of times a big reason people fail is because they're just super hungry. And so by having a set amount of meals per day, we're able to one, they, they know when their next meal is coming, right? They know that, hey, I still have two meals for today. So they have a general idea what that looks like. But then two, we can we can find a meal timing strategy and how many meals you eat per day that, that keeps you feeling possible throughout the day. Whereas if it's one day you eat two, two meals, that day you're probably going to be a little bit hungrier. Then the next day you eat four meals, maybe you're going to be less hungry. So if we can work on that 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 structure from day to day and, and have, that's one thing that I like to do there with that. So I would say those are the two biggest. Another thing I like to do is, Instead of being, again, overly restrictive with calories and macros, instead of having clients hit exact numbers, I like to give them a range, right? And that range can be um, from a calorie range. It can be a macro range. So giving them some ranges just to give them a little bit of flexibility from day to day there to where they don't feel like they need to hit this exact number um, each and every day. Because I think the big thing is we want to get you within... We want to get you within the ballpark. We just don't want you to be all over the place. So sure. I like yeah. to do ranges. So depending on the phase that they're in from a nutrition perspective, it could be a little bit of a higher range. It could be a little bit of a lower range in terms of maybe it's a hundred calorie range. Maybe it's a 200 calorie range. Maybe it's 10. We want to be within 10 grams of our protein, or maybe it's 20. And I think it also depends on the client and, and what they you know, what, how, what you know about them, because again, some people are going to be better with a little bit more flexibility. Some people aren't yeah. going to be as good with flexibility. So I think knowing your client and knowing when and how to pull that, pull those levers and how flexible you want to be with them is it's all part of the, the coaching process, but those are a few things. And again, that, that allows for more flexibility from day to day. So maybe somebody is they have an event or they have a really hard training day, but maybe they're going to eat a little bit more calories that day. And then another day they, they don't have an event. They're maybe a little less active. Maybe that's a day where you eat just a little less food on, on that day. And at the end of the day, what you do over the week and, and over weeks is going to be the most important to really change your body composition there with that. So those are a few strategies. We have some other smaller strategies that you can potentially implement diet breaks, refeed days as well to help with adherence. Again, there's no magic to them in terms of like fat loss or anything like that, but they can be helpful from a mental perspective. And the research people that that do like these diet breaks where they take either a couple of days off of dieting, go back to their maintenance, or they take multiple weeks, they have found to not have as much like diet fatigue at the end and, and diet fatigue being things like high hunger levels, low energy, stuff like that. Food, very food focused as, as well too. Those are a few ways there to help with the sustain, sustainability and consistency. Oh man, amen to everything you said there. Like 
the I heard Nick Bear say this on his podcast during the week, and I love the idea. You're alluding to it as well. Forward thinking, backward planning. As you said, having a plan in place. And something I like to say for my clients is don't go to bed without knowing what you're going to eat the following day. Just It doesn't even mean you have to have your meals prepped, but at least have a meal plan in place. So you know what you're going to have for breakfast, what you're going to have for lunch, dinner, and so on. So you're not just eating on the go. Jeff, you and I'm sure anyone listen, we're all the same. The worst time to decide what to eat is when you're hungry, when you're ravenous, when you're tired after a stressful day at work, because that's when your emotional mind kicks in and your logical brain is going to take the back seat. That's when you're picking for the chocolate. That's when you're snacking. That's when your snack calories add up to four, five, six hundred calories. Something else you said there, which is also super helpful, I feel, for anyone, particularly if you're adherence and sustainability. I know this varies per client. But for some people, they are quite regimented on the diet and they do hit the macros. And over a period of time, as Jeff said, that is when fatigue can build up. I found myself at the bodybuilding on a Sunday evening because I knew we trained legs on a Monday. As little as 50 grams of extra carbs, just a small extra serving of rice. It's like you have a new pair of legs the following day going for a walk. Yep. So the diet breaks, I think there are even just many refeeds like that. Provided that they're structured and not just done off the cuff, they can be super, super effective for mental or just from a mental perspective, but also for washing off fatigue. Jeff, that's awesome, man. Um, well, can I, yeah, can go I ahead, follow man. up with just a couple more things? I, th- I think on that too, we take, we, we talk about deloads for like training. It's to me, these are deloads from dieting as well too. So I, I think they can be super helpful again, more so from a mental standpoint, but even from a, a physiological standpoint, I do think they can be helpful, but they're not going to speed up fat loss or anything like that. Unfortunately, that would be awesome. Two, two other things I wanted to go over real quick on this was one thing that, that helps me and I, and I'm sure you've done this too, is just having a go-to meal. So like having maybe one to two meals that are pretty much the same every single day. Again, I know for a lot of people that's, that sounds awful, but man, that can just be super helpful because it just takes the thought process out of it. You can just do it. And, and again, maybe you don't keep that in this, you don't keep the same meals for a year. Maybe you have a rotation of three to five meals that you sure. rotate through, but at any one time you have two that you're always having. And then maybe you have one meal throughout the day that is something that's a little bit more I um, love spon- that. spontaneous and something that's a little bit different because again, man, that's been a game changer for me where it's like my morning, my breakfast is 95% of the time, the same thing. And then my pre-workout meal is pretty much the same thing. And then I have like my post-workout meal, and my dinner meal that are going to be a little bit different from time to time. And that can be super helpful. And then lastly, on the adherence standpoint, a lot of people think that they're either they've, it, it's their genetics or something like that. But at the end of the day, or maybe they they think their calories are too low or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, man, it's adherence is going to be the biggest thing here. And that's typically what is causing people to not see the results they want to see is just adherence. And let me uh, finish this up by saying it's not easy, right? Like in today's modern world, man, it's tough to stay consistent with your caloric amount, especially the lower it is. So it's not easy. We have tasty foods around that make things really challenging. It's easy to be sedentary. A lot of events that we go to having a social life usually involves drinks or food, right? So it is challenging. It's not easy, but adherence typically is the biggest thing. And as you mentioned with the diet fatigue, as you lose more weight, the longer you diet and the the more weight you lose, the the diet fatigue is going to start to show up more hunger. So you have that going against you as well too, in combination with all the other things I mentioned. And then on top of it, as the longer we do something, the less kind of like motivated and the less we want to do it. So not only do you have all these things pulling you away already, but then the fact that the longer you do something, you're just not as motivated to do it. And you, you almost, we start to take the path of least resistance and we start to yeah. maybe, instead of measuring things out, now we start to just eyeball it or, Hey, you know what? I'm just going to have this, this bag of chips, or I'm going to have this, these cookies now because I've been doing good. And these things slowly start to creep in and hundred percent but adherence long term ends up really being a challenging and unfortunately to really lose body fat, like you have to be in that consistent calorie deficit over extended periods of time, not just a week or two. So it's it is really challenging. Um, but these are all things that can help with that adherence side of things. Absolutely. And just a final note on adherence, something that I found when I'm over here in Dubai at the moment, I'm in control of my food environment. And it's very easy for me, just insta shop every week, order the groceries in. I'm in control of what comes in, what goes out. When I flew back home to Ireland for Christmas, obviously being back at home again, being back with my parents and so on, food environment, it just made me realize and reiterate the importance of food environments that, Jeff, you and I, we both did PN Precision Nutrition. John Berardi's number one rule was always, if a food is in the house, sooner or later, it's going to be 
So if you don't want to slip, don't go to slippery places. If cookies, if chocolate, for me, it's freaking granola, chocolate flavored granola. Oh, <laughs> I don't do yep. moderation with that. If a food is in your house and that's a quote unquote a weakness of yours or it triggers you or causes you to binge eat, look, at least increase the resistance and don't buy it and make yourself walk or drive to the shop if you really crave. Because otherwise, you're just, as Jeff said there, adhering to so important, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Jeff, when it comes to your training, because we spoke a lot about, obviously, nutrition there. And I know for, yep. for training, there's no one kind of perfect workout, whether you want to build muscle or lose fat. There's a lot of principles you can follow. What are some of your principles that you would adhere to from your own personal standpoint and also from a coaching perspective? Yeah, for training specifically, right? You said? Yeah, exactly. We'll say how many sets per body part? How do you go about like exercise selection, rep ranges, and so on? Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. Yeah. So I like to, if somebody is trying to do a body recomp, they want to build more muscle, they want to lose body fat. I think the main thing, we, the best thing we can do from a training perspective is make it specific to that goal, right? And so what does that look like? Some things you can do to make your training more specific to building muscle would be, I think, uh, like you said, the principles are important. The first thing that I commonly see that people do mess up on here with this is their, their intensity of training it, like they, they train hard, but maybe it's in a way that isn't necessarily taking the target muscle close to failure, right? So they'll maybe overly focus on like the weight that they're doing. So then their technique starts to suffer. So then like other, other muscles or, or joints start to, to take over, right? Um, or maybe they're just focused on just the burn uh, with, with their training um, uh, there with that. I think making sure you take the target muscle closer to failure is going to be key. And, and again, that's where... It's not necessarily just lifting more weight. It's not just making it feel tougher. It's let's say you're doing a I'm trying to think of a good, let's say you're doing like a hack squat, right? That's freaking hard. That's a tough machine to use. Right. And a lot of times people, they fly through it. They have a rep range of like six to 10. And as long as they're in that rep range, that's the biggest thing. They're not really focused on anything else. And they're not really focused on like the movement that they're doing. It's just, Hey, I need to get it from point A to point B. So sure. we can get a little bit more specific by making sure that you're taking the quad, like ideal, you're probably training the quads in that muscle, in that uh, exercise. So taking the quads close to failure is going to be uh, important, right? Getting closer to failure is going to look like, Hey, things are really starting to slow down. It's getting really challenging, yeah. but at the same time, it's staying focused and it's making sure that you're doing that. It, your technique is not breaking down. And that's what gets really challenging for some people. There is usually all those things aren't in place, right? Either their technique breaks down or they're not staying focused um, there with that. Training a little bit closer to failure, but actually taking the target muscle close to failure is, is one big thing that I really try to push um, there with that. And that's been a, a game changer, right? So I think with that, even if you think your form is great, definitely take some videos, double check it to make sure. And saying this, you can definitely overdo technique and overly focus on technique to then For where sure. you don't ever push it. Yeah. So you do want to walk that fine line, right? I'm not saying you need everything needs to be super slow and you got to feel you got to have the super good mind muscle connection. Like you do still need to push yourself, but I think people can make themselves, they can get their heart rate up. They can get a pump, but they don't actually take the target muscle close to failure enough. So that would be one big thing. Also like making sure that you are providing some sort of overload over time. So whether you're doing more reps or you're doing more weight, do make sure you're pushing and you are progressing over time, right? That's a big thing that I see there with a big mistake people make with training to build muscle is Maybe they're not logging it or they're just not trying to, to do more over time. And again, you don't necessarily just have to do more weight every time you go into the gym um, because that can lead to poor execution and whatnot. But over time, you do want to make sure things improve and, and, and you get stronger and you do more reps over time. So those would be the, the the two big ones that I see where people need to improve there. I don't know if you have any follow-ups. If not, I can go into the amount of sets per week, exercise selection, what that looks like and stuff like that. Yeah, no, every, everything you said there, again, I'm really on par with that. And just as you mentioned there with the hack squad, like really targeting the desired muscle. And that's why, obviously, you just should know like what the purpose of every exercise in your program or plan is and the reason that you're doing it. And not every exercise is created equal. Like doing a set of bicep curls to failure is a complete different response to doing a set of deadlifts for failure from both the training and recovery perspectives. You have to like just know your body type, but also exercise specific too and i saw something funny in, in as well in the gym jeff and everyone to their own but there's this girl she was in she was doing a leg press uh, angle leg press and she's with her pt and i was during my rest was doing a set of set of squats 
she had like six plates on either side, six twenty or six forty pound, forty five pound plates on either side. I'm like, whoa, like she's leg pressing more than yep. I am. And like when you speak about there, like getting that full stretch and taking the, the muscle through a full range of motion, if I, I'd barely classify it as a quarter, <laughs> like a quarter rep, like it was like the most minimal knee bend. And then she's just pressing it again. So look, sometimes you have to drop the ego at the door, drop the weight and just really focus on feeling the muscles you were saying, Jeff. You know, in that specific example, it's, you know, what she's doing, there's probably some sort of adaptation going on. She's probably getting stronger. She's probably building some sure. muscle in that process, but she's also probably putting a lot of stress on her, on yeah. other joints. Um, and, and over time, you know, that's just going to lead to not over, it's just, it's not going to be as productive as it could be from a muscle building standpoint, right? Because she's one, maybe she's going to start to get some pain in her hips. Maybe she's going to start to get some pain in her knees over time, which is going to limit what she can do. Right. But again, she's also, like I said there in that specific example, like you mentioned, she's putting stress on other muscle groups that maybe should be resting during that period of time. Right. And then that's just going to lead to less productive training in, in, in other aspects. So like you said, you, you do need to, to check your ego at the door here and if anything, I think finding ways to be able to do less weight, but to get more out of it, really from a long-term sustainability that. standpoint, yeah. is, is a great way to go. Now, again, this doesn't mean, okay, now go do the 10 pounds for everything and go super light. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying, but the if you can find ways. I always have to, with my training, I've been training for muscle growth for 10 plus years now. And like, I still have to like kind of recalibrate my weights, my technique over time. And I always think of it in a positive way because I know that I'm getting more out of each rep than at that point. I, I, I think- yeah, really focusing on not just how much weight you're doing is, is super important. I think with building muscle too, a big mistake I see made is people maybe overly focusing on like training in like the one to five rep range, maybe like overly focused on just trying to increase their one rep max. And again, I think there's a time and place. And, and if you like doing that type of training, like really heavy training, like there is a time and a place and you can fit it into a muscle building program. But if that's the only thing you're focused on, I do think that's going to lead to suboptimal okay. muscle growth yeah. um, over time. So maybe spending more time in that like six to 12, six to 15 rep range um, can be super helpful. And And one last thing here too on this, before I hand it back to you is, I like to work in rep ranges with clients versus, hey, you need to do six Amen. reps or, right? Because at the end of the day, the rep range is the most important and that making sure you take that target muscle close to failure is most important. And, and what I see happen a lot of times, if you focus on maybe just one rep or just checking the boxes, is a lot of people do end up leaving more in the tank, right? It's, oh, hey, my, my program calls for eight reps. I've just got to get to eight reps and that's what I need to do. But then it's, you could have done like 12 reps with that weight and that's, you're still getting something out of it. But again, we can make it more productive if you worked in a rep range um, and got a little bit closer to failure uh, there with Amen, that. Amen, brother. Yeah, I, I really like that idea. And again, it's what you mentioned earlier on too. It's like calorie ranges as well, because some people, if they're told they can only have 2,000 calories a day, they're like, if they go over by 50, they nearly freak out and say, I've already eaten 50 extra, I may as well keep going, and suddenly it's a 3,000 calorie a day. But I like that with rep ranges too, but also from the standpoint that sometimes when you go to the gym and maybe you didn't have a great night's sleep and your performance is slightly off, you can feel like somewhat of a failure for, God, I was, I was lifting this weight last week for eight reps. This week, I'm only able to hit six. Whereas if your program had six to eight rep ranges, you're still within the given or the desired rep range, which means on some days you're feeling it, you can push that bit higher, go for the higher range. But some days you're lacking sleep, your recovery is not as good. You can still hit the lower range, provided you're, you're within that desired reps. I love that, Jeff. And tell me, when it comes to like sets per body part per week, what would be the optimal amount for someone to aim for? Yeah. So this, man, this is, a, I think, a question that people are still trying to, to figure out for sure what that is. I tip, What I typically end up doing with clients is anywhere between, I would say, 6 to 12 is is usually the sets per week that, that we end up getting to. Now, this isn't to say that for some people go higher, but I think if, if I were to look over every client's program, I think 6 to 12 is that kind of sweet spot um, per muscle group, right? And this is direct sets because sometimes you could count like if you're doing back work, you sure. can count that towards biceps. So this is like yeah. direct sets um, there with that. But instead of chasing a set number, just talk, do the things that I talked about earlier, where you're more focused on finding movements that really fit you um, best, that you really get a good stimulus that you really like, make sure you're getting closer to failure, make sure you're really focused on your execution and technique. And what I find is you end up being able to do less sets than you think, right? Whereas I feel like people that feel like they need to do really high training volumes, it typically comes down to 
something, one of those things being off that we talked about, right? Whether it's an execution standpoint, um, whether it's a maybe not a great exercise for you, maybe you're not pushing close enough to failure, right? Because when you do those things, you end up needing to, to do a little bit more. Also rest times too. If you're trying to go super quick with it, and maybe you're only resting like 30 seconds in between sets, you are likely going to need to do a little bit more um, volume um, there with that. So I think for most people, six to 12, but then again, if we're if there is a certain body part that maybe somebody wants to build or maybe isn't as responsive, we may get into the 12 to 20 um, yeah. sets per week there. But I haven't had a lot of situations where anyone's needed to go over that once they fix those things that we I talked mean, we about awesome. initially. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And Jeff, just to, for the final five or 10 minutes to wrap it, wrap things up, I'd be curious <laughs> to hear your take on two things. So first of all, cardio preferred forms of cardio and secondly once we get these amazing results how do we actually maintain them let's start out with the first question jeff what's your preferred form of cardio for someone doing a body recall yeah so i like to have clients focus on first like overall activity so i like to do this via like steps like having a step count like tracking that making sure that their overall activity levels are in where we want them to be just because you can work out really hard for an hour, but if you're not really active the rest of the day, it's that's good. Like you're still going to again, see some sort of adaptation that from an overall activity standpoint, not only from an energy expenditure standpoint, but from an overall health standpoint and like appetite regulation, if our overall activity levels are relatively low, those are going to be out of whack. So if you're getting like sub 6,000 steps per day, you might have, you might feel a little bit hungrier than you typically would if you maybe moved uh, a, a little bit more, whether that's just because you're bored sure, to eat it, you're, yeah. you're more likely to, to eat when you're bored or whatever that may be. But even from a digestion standpoint, getting anywhere, I think between six to 10,000 steps per day is going to help with that. It's going to help with your appetite regulation. You're going to be more likely to eat in line with the amount of calories you're burning. And then just mental standpoint too, right? It's nice to get some movement in throughout the day, especially most people do just sit at their desk or on you know at yeah. their couch all day. So getting some movement in there. So always make sure that overall movement's there. But this is one thing I have changed my mind on is cardio and, and how it's placed within like a, a body recomp, changing your body. And my old thought was, hey, we just need to focus on steps and anything extra just isn't going to be worth our time and you're just going to lose muscle and, and, and whatnot. But I've changed my mind on this in the last year where I do see a lot of benefit of if you have the time to dedicate to this, taking it maybe at least one to two days per week where you do some sort of cardiovascular activity that is going to get that heart rate a little bit higher for sustained periods of time, right? Sure. Not like when you're just lifting weights and you get your heart rate up. We're talking like, hey, you, you jump on the bike for 30 to 45 minutes and you get that heart rate, not super high, right? Where you're like, you're at, almost at your max heart rate, getting it up into your, what people call like their zone two, zone three, right? This is usually anywhere from 130 to 160 beats per minute there with yeah. that, right? So, so doing that at least one to two times a week, I have found to be super helpful, not only from an energy expenditure standpoint, you are going to expend energy doing that, but that's not why we're doing it. We're not doing it for fat loss purposes. We're doing it from just the overall cardiovascular health standpoint. We're talking long-term here with this, like that's going to be great for your long-term health. Also, being in better cardiovascular shape is likely going to make your body just more receptive to fat loss, to muscle building. You're going to be able to recover better in between training sessions, in between sets. Sure, man. Um, and you're going to be able to, your body's going to be better at handling the, the food that you give it as well too, right? So it's going to utilize those nutrients to your muscles much better rather than like storing just as fat and stuff like that too. That's how I've done, how I've changed my mind on cardio. What I like to do for cardio is something that is low impact. So if you can choose like an elliptical or a bike or something like that, I would prefer that over say running or something like that. But at the end of the day, if you're programming smartly and you're not overdoing the cardio, I think you're fine with doing whatever you enjoy that's going to get you to, to stick to it. And I think a good balance would be maybe one to one session a week where it's a little bit longer. It's anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. And again, maybe it's closer to that zone two-ish, zone three-ish kind of range there that I was talking about. And then maybe once a week, if you have the time to get that heart rate up for maybe shorter periods of time, but closer to your like higher intensity, yeah. right? Yeah. So again, these are going to be shorter bursts there with that. And that can be a good way to get a good spectrum of everything. But with the cardio, it's always going to be based on the client's time and what they can dedicate to it. So we don't want it to replace too much weight training because then we're not going to be able to build muscle like we want in a body recomp, right? So it, it, it is time dependent um, on that. But so I would say order of operations would be, hey, get your weight training, right? We want to make sure we're providing the stimulus that we need to build muscle. 
And then from there, your overall activity, make sure you're getting enough movement in throughout each and every day. We do that via steps. And then third would be like, hey, let's, if we have time left over, let's try to get some dedicated cardio training in for overall health and all the other things I, I mentioned there. Amazing, man. I'm with you on all of that, like literally all of that. And as you said there, something I found that particularly when you're doing that zone two cardio, that your effort, as long as you're not overdoing it, making the goal, keeping the goal of the goal. But as you said, your recovery time and the amount of volume you're able to handle, it actually would increase if you have a better cardio base because you'd be able to, you potentially don't need to rest as long, or at least your heart rate isn't going to be as elevated as long when you've that got that like good, really solid cardio base there. I know myself when I'm doing the bike work or when I'm doing a bit of running here and there, my lifts, like if Anthony had improved, provided I'm not overdoing that volume. So I'm absolutely all with you in that. Cardio will not kill your gains, provided you're not overdoing yep. it. Finally, Jeff, yep. because we're, we're just coming up in time here, but for someone who gets these amazing results and they want to keep them now over the summer holidays, what are some practical ways to maintain it? Yeah. Again, there's a few things uh, that we've talked about that we can tie into this too. I think the first thing is your methods, like really, I, I think people over, like, they look so much at that period of time afterwards because we know that's a challenging time, right? In the research, we've shown that people can lose weight, but maintaining it is, is, is super challenging. I think the first thing we can do here is what are your methods during that period of time? I think the more drastic the methods are, the, the sure. tougher they are, that's going to that's gonna make it less likely that you're going to stick to this change over time, right? So I think the first thing is look at the time at, during the fat loss, during the body recomp. What are your methods like? That's going to be the most important. If you're Make sure those are in line with what we talked about today, and that will set you up for a much easier time following, following whatever fat loss, body recomp, whatever you're trying to do there. Next, make sure you continue to lift weights afterwards, right? Because no matter what, even if you do gain a little bit, it's okay. At the very least, if you're gaining a little bit of weight, your weight yeah. training still doing the things we talked about. It's like your body's still going to partition some of those nutrients towards adding more muscle. It's not just going to be body fat. Whereas you take somebody that they just stop weight training, they stop staying active. It's okay. Now you're setting yourself up to, to not be successful here in this period of time yeah. afterwards. So that would be that. Continue to make sure that you stay active. Like we just talked about, continue to get your movement in. do some form of self-monitoring, right? You don't necessarily have to continue to track your calories if you want to take a break, but you need to do some form of self-monitoring, -moder whether that's, again, you maybe dial back and just focus on how many meals you eat per day, or maybe you're just tracking your body weight or measurements or progress pictures, but continue to do some form of, of self-monitoring after that period of time. Again, maybe during your body recomp fat loss phase, we're up here with what we're tracking, but now we're we're dialing back a little bit what we're doing, but still some form of self-monitoring um, can be super helpful. Uh, I This again goes on the front end of everything, but I like to periodize nutrition with clients, right? So again, maybe we're having a fat loss phase body recomp phase for six to 12 weeks, 12 to 16 weeks, whatever it may be. But then from there, now we're going to go into a phase where we're fueling our body more, giving it enough calories. And then you do that oh, for God, an extended period amount of time. And then you maybe it's like, Hey, I still want to lose a little bit more body fat again. Then you go back to that at another time, making sure that you're not always trying to fat loss diet. Oh, Hey, I'm just continuing to try and get leaner and leaner. Take some time away from trying to get leaner and, and instead fuel your body and really try to improve from that standpoint there with that. So those are the main ones. And then I guess another one would be if you just after your, say you dropped some weight, really try to be careful with adding in a ton of tasty food afterwards. Your yes. body is going to be, <laughs> <laughs> your body, like at that point, I'm sure you felt this when you did your bodybuilding show. It's everything just tastes freaking amazing. And it's, yeah. you're going to have such a tough time if you were like, okay, cool. The diet's over. Now I can just go back to eating whatever I want. And again, we want to have some flexibility after that phase, but going too much Not on, too that, much. on yes. that spectrum. It's you're going to set yourself up. It's just going to be really hard to moderate your, your food intake. It's going to be, you're going to end up going super low food volume, really high calorie dense foods. And it's, you're going to be like, you're eating 2000 calories, but really you're eating like 5,000. They're just going to want yeah. to continue, continue to want more. Really try to limit how much tasty food you have. If anything, like you said, just like you did in your refeeds, just increase the amount of like rice you have or your diet foods. And then sprinkle in a little bit of tasty food and as you get further and further away from that exactly that's you know, when you can, can start more. to increase it yeah so oh man jeff this has been amazing like everyone if you haven't had a pen and paper definitely listen back a ton of value here everything from how to calculate your calories your protein your macros some practical ways with your food environment type of training you're doing 
adding good intensity, adding volume, keeping the keeping it off long term. Jeff, a ton of value here for any of our listeners who want to learn a bit more about you or what you offer, Jeff. Where's the best place to send them? And then for anyone listening, I'll post all the links in the show notes. Yeah. So I have a few, I'm going to lead them to three places. So one, my Instagram, Jeff, H-O-E-H-N underscore. I'm most active there. I do Q and A's a couple times a week, so you can reach out to me there. I have my podcast, the Mind Muscle Connection podcast. Like we talked about off air, I post three video, three episodes per week, two solo, yeah, one guest. And then lastly, I do have a body recomp masterclass. It's that is in my bio on Instagram, or you can just reach out to me on Instagram and I'll send it over to you. And I go over the things we talked about today, so in awesome. a little bit more detail. So a hundred percent. So I'll post those links in the show notes. So make sure you check out Jeff's socials, check out his podcast, brilliant podcast, really enjoyed some of his episodes. And if you're not already doing so, please do subscribe to the Lifestyle Lifter show as well. So you don't miss out on our weekly uploads. Jeff, thank you so much for hopping on. This has been amazing, brother. I appreciate you and your time. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian, man. It was a great time. Great chat. And yep. Talk to you soon, man.